Today's talk will be about dealing with pantry pests. It's presented by Carrie Wimbill Rojas. Carrie is the Associate Director for Urban and Community IPM and Area Urban IPM Advisor for Yolo, Solano, and Sacramento counties. As Associate Director, Carrie provides leadership and coordinates communication and educational efforts to address pest issues around homes, structures, landscapes, gardens, schools, and public areas. Carrie, you can share your slides. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. Today, we will talk about pantry pests and um, how to um, identify them and, and how to um, deal with them, either by not introducing them into your, your kitchen or your home, and if you do have them, how to um, get rid of them. Uh, lots of different pests to talk about and lots of different methods, but um, not impossible. All right, great. So as uh, Belinda said, I'm the Associate Director for Urban and Community IPM with the Statewide IPM Program, and we deal with both indoor and outdoor pests. Um, today, as we talk about pantry pests, um, I'm also going to share some of the control measures and some of the pests that we'll talk about are pests that tend to be outdoors that come indoors or um, the specific pantry pests that are in that category. But when we talk about controlling pests, we do mention IPM, and I want to define it here before uh, we use that acronym going on. Many of you joining us have seen our videos before, uh, or our webinars before, but Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, is a concept that helps us um, find effective solutions to manage our pests that are science-based and research-based. And we use IPM uh, in both non-chemical uh, control measures as well as potential chemical or pesticide control measures. But hopefully by using IPM, you will reduce your need for pesticides and reduce your exposure, exposure to them, especially indoors, as we were talking about some of these indoor pests. And of course, that's going to lead to um, better health and a safer environment. But before any control measures can be taken or should be taken on a pest that you find, you need to make sure that it is the pest is identified correctly. That way you'll know precisely what to do, learn a little bit about the pest so that you can have the most effective pest management. And so we'll talk about some of these pests today and get into some of the specifics and also identification. Um, so some of the, the pests that are considered pantry pests are beetles and moths, but there are other pests listed on the screen that come into the kitchen and can get into our pantries and into our stored foodstuffs. So I'll go through each one of these and a couple others that are not um, uh, specifically mentioned here, but all of these are, are kitchen and or pantry pests. So first, why do we care about pantry pests? And some of us may not have a full on pantry. You know, you just have your cupboards that you store your food. So when we talk about pantries, we're really just talking about the area that we store food in the kitchen or another room or could even be um, uh, the garage or what have you. But uh, generally, pantry pests are any kind of pest that will attack our stored food. And that could be anything from spices to cereals to flowers, even chocolate. I have found um, uh, one of these pests in my chocolate before. And yes, it was very old chocolate, but still, um, you know, it's uh, kind of alarming when you open something and you, you find, uh, you know, an insect in it. Um, but they will enter your home generally in the food that you're bringing in that's already infested that you may or may not um, have any idea that they could be there. And often you don't notice that the pest is present uh, for some time. Some of these pests will be inside um, the, the food stuffs as eggs or really undetectable because they are inside the bean or inside the grain. And then you don't notice them until you see moths flying around or you pick up something like the chocolate or something you wanted to eat and you see the physical uh, insect or uh, 
other parts in them. And so infested food can become uh, contaminated with the, the hairs and other body parts of these insects fecal droppings, either from insects or later I'll talk about rats. Um, some of these, these pests create webbing and there's other secretions. So um, sometimes um, a person might be sensitive to eating these items, sometimes not, uh, depending on what pest it is. It may be uh, something we're, we're con um, concerned about disease but with, with some of the insect body parts, you know, um, they won't hurt you. But um, pantry pests can introduce microbes into the food um, through opening the food or damaging the food. And that can lead to uh, the food becoming rotten, especially when the conditions are warm or there's moisture around um, and, uh, and high humidity. So there's a lot of reasons that we, we care about pantry pests. And maybe don't want them in our food. So in general, pantry pests and other pests that we'll talk about today are looking for food, water, and shelter. And so some of these pests, um, they really thrive in an indoor environment. And if you have the food there, they will you know, thank you for it. Some of the other pests that we'll talk about today tend to be outdoors and will come indoors when there's a change in the weather or they are looking for foodstuffs. And if the food is uh, not contained or not sealed in containers, then it makes it relatively easy for them to, to get to. So we'll talk about how we can limit that today. So first, let me get into the pantry pests that we have categorized as that group of, of pests that we typically may find in our stored food areas. So the first one to mention is um, the meal moth. Uh, the most common meal moth that we find in California in our pantries and our stored food is the Indian meal moth. And that's what's pictured there. So the, um, the adult is the moth stage and they fly, they have wings. And as I mentioned a couple slides ago, we may not even know that we have these until we start seeing uh, these little tiny moths flying around the kitchen or maybe even dead in the, in the cupboard on the cabinet um, on the shelves. Uh, so it's a small reddish, um, small moth with reddish brown wings, but their larvae, which are pictured at the top, are uh, caterpillars and they are small. As they feed, they, so they had, they usually come into food maybe as eggs. As they hatch out of the egg, they um, become the larval stage of the insect and they will feed on things like cereals, um, flowers, dried fruit. You can see the adults on what looks like dried fruit, um, nuts, and as I mentioned, chocolate. Uh, and the, the uh, larval stage, they make webs. So you can see the one pictured is within a web, but the picture at the bottom shows webbing inside of a package where there was an infestation and you open the package and you see this kind of webbing. Uh, and so they leave behind these silken threads. And then the, the one at the top um, is a later stage larva that has spun a cocoon where it then goes to pupate before it turns into the adult. And so it, these can be in the food for six to eight weeks before they emerge as adults, adults and before you might see them. Another kind of pantry pest is a beetle. Um, so the, the meal moth, the Indian meal moth is the most common one that we're going to see. Uh, the rest that I will talk about in the pantry pest section are mostly beetles and weevils. Uh, and so one in particular is called the warehouse beetle. And this beetle feeds on cereals and um, candies and cookies, pet food, um, beans, pasta, uh, and, and spices. Um, they lay a lot of eggs and they can lay 90 eggs. Um, a female can lay 90 eggs in the food um, and then that can lead to the infestation. Um, the larvae, as you can see pictured there, have little bristles and those bristles as they move and feed can be shed into the foods. And these little 
um, hairs, these little bristles can cause irritation to some people um, in their mouth and, and digestive system as they might eat them. And so, as I said, some of these may be in our food and we don't know it, but, you know, you eat something and it really, you know, causes some problems. Um, this one, this warehouse beetle can develop uh, within 40 day, 45 days from egg to the adult stage. And while the beetle may fly, uh, they're not strong flyers. So you might just see the beetles crawling or you see these, these larvae uh, in infested items. Another kind of beetle or two kinds of beetles are the sawtooth beetle and the merchant grain beetle. And these both have very similar uh, body types. You can see the adult in the picture in the middle, um, a close up of the adult. And then at the bottom, you, you can see the picture of an infested uh, stored grain. These are really small beetles, by the way. Uh, so they can easily go unnoticed, um, but they are longer and, and more slender than the warehouse beetle that we saw and some of the other beetles that we'll talk about. Uh, and then the upper picture, you can see the larval stage of this beetle. So they feed on um, lots of different foodstuffs uh, similar to the, the previous pests, uh, including flowers and candies and dried fruit and um, pet food and even bird seed. So you may not have these in your cupboard where you keep your food, but if you have stored pet food, either indoor, outdoor, in the garage, um, you have birds and there's bird seed. Um, I know birds can be uh, fairly messy uh, when they eat. And so the, the seeds that fall to the bottom of the cage can also be attractive to these. So just, you know, if you have these items uh, and are concerned about beetles or have beetles, um, these beetles, knowing what they're going to and what their potential for infesting the kitchen or the house or the stored food areas is important. Uh, so they have um, these little tooth-like projections kind of on their, their shoulders, if, if you can see that, um, which helps distinguish them from other beetles. But the female, again, is going to lay her eggs in the food material that the developing larvae will then eat. Um, and she can also lay eggs within a, uh, a kernel of grains. And so if that egg is within a grain, it's hard to notice when the food is brought into the house. Uh, and so these larvae, as they develop, they also construct cocoon-like coverings, um, but that it's made of the food that they're eating. So they, they Kind of pupate within their their food. And this one takes um, about 30 days, about 40 weeks to go from egg to adult. So they can develop uh, pretty quickly uh, within our, our stored foods. Another group of beetles are the confused beetle and the red flower beetle. And these look similar to each other, which is also why they're grouped. And um, they feed on grains and nuts, dried fruit, uh, dried fruit, um, uh, drugstore items, drugs, and chocolate. And so they lay eggs in their food material um, in the grains. And the larvae are these white uh, uh, little worm-like um, organisms that you can see here. And they're, they're not very big. They're not even uh, half an inch long. And so as they feed on the foodstuffs and they're white so they can be easily camouflaged, they go through their growth stage and then they will pupate, which is the picture that I'm circling right here. Um, they pupate and then those hatch out into the adults. The adults then go and find a mate and they will lay their eggs and continue the cycle. Uh, and so it takes them about six weeks to go from the egg stage to the adult stage. And with all of these in the presence of food, they can continue um, having more and more generations uh, as long as the food is there and the conditions are, are good for their development, which is, as I said, usually uh, warmth condition, warm conditions, sometimes some moisture and definitely the food source. 
Uh, another group of beetles are the drugstore beetle and the cigarette beetle. These two beetles look fairly similar to each other, like the other two groups, um, but they can be found in, in slightly different um, areas. Uh, the cigarette beetle, uh, so named because it was something that they found in um, tobacco products, especially in um, in uh, tobacco warehouses, cigarette um, manufacturing areas. So it doesn't just feed on tobacco and um, and cigars, but it will feed on those. Uh, but they also feed on herbs, especially dried herbs, uh, spices, which are often dried herbs, um, nuts, cereals, and woolen materials. And so um, again, many of these items may be in your kitchen, they may be in the pantry, but uh, someone may have tobacco products uh, in the bedroom or in a drawer somewhere else or in the living room. And so if you do have those products and you find you know, these beetles around, it may be because they are feeding on um, the tobacco and, and cigar products that are not in the kitchen. And those beetles can then find their way to the kitchen for some of these other foods. Um, but the adult female lays eggs in the food. The grubs are um, up here, you can see these, these little white grubs and they have these, these tiny hairs. So just like the other beetles that we were mentioning, some of these hairs uh, when ingested or um, sometimes breathed in, they can be bothersome. Uh, it takes six weeks to go from the egg stage to the adult stage for the cigarette beetle. Uh, for drugstore beetles, these are named because they were found you know, in the drugstores where lots of different products are stored, um, where sometimes, um, foodstuffs or tobacco products are also stored, um, but they do feed on pharmaceuticals, seeds, pet foods, spices, and um, lots of different grains and flour mixes. So as it says there, just about anything. So the drugstore beetles are, um, are pretty widely um, favoring the, the things that we have in our pantries and in, in our homes. And the adult female lays eggs in the dry materials. And then the grubs pictured here, very similar looking grub, um, uh, tunnels through and, and feeds on the materials. And so this beetle takes about two months to go from, from egg stage to the adult stage, and then starts another cycle of egg, larva, pupa, adult. All right, so other beetles and weevils that we may see in our foodstuffs, um, there is a uh, beetle called the lesser grain borer, and this is found on wheat and corn, rice and millet. So while we bring these items in the dry form into our homes, um, often these pests are, are bigger problems in the, the um, production area of of the um, the crops. So we we may see them in our homes, but they're not as common as some of those other beetles and the moths. But certainly they can be introduced as we bring in um, any of the the raw materials. We also have the granary and rice weevils, and so a weevil is a type of a beetle, but the weevils have a little snout, um, whereas beetles don't have that projection and you can see uh, this is uh, these are adult weevils you can see that little snout and then these are also weevils and they have a little snout uh, so these uh, granary and rice weevils feed on wheats um, and also oats or corn uh, pasta which is made out of wheat and rice uh, and so again these can be brought into our house in the um, the camouflaged egg stage, and then we don't notice it until they have developed into the uh, the adult stage, and then we see the infestation. So up here in the picture, you can see some of the egg stages, and and they match their food. So it's really easy on these these um, uh, black eyed peas that we would miss them, um, or the eggs are within the grains here, 
and, and because they're so small, we don't see them. Uh, and the last one here is the cowpea uh, bean weevil. And so again, the egg, which is white, may be laid you know, right on top or inside the, the dried bean. And once the, uh, the larval stage and the adult stage uh, are reached, then we, uh, we might see the infestation. And you can see this is a pretty good infestation where the beetle has burrowed through the bean and really just ruin this, this collection of beans because um, for one, we may not want to eat it, but also um, it reduces the amount of food there and the nutrition of the food. Uh, and so the cowpea and bean weevils um, mainly feed on the stored beans. So with that very quick introduction to the uh, specific pantry pests and I will have other pests that get into the house that we'll cover after this. Um, I talk about them coming into the house and sometimes we just may not notice that. So one really good way to make sure we don't uh, have a, an infestation that gets out of hand or we try to limit the spread is when you bring in uh, foods that might be susceptible and you can see we've got all kinds of grains and rice and it's not just flour in a bag it's cereal um, you know that's already processed that can be in any of those so you want to when you bring in these these food items into the house you can store them in the freezer if they are items that can be frozen you can store them in the freezer uh, the freezer will kill most life stages of the insects, the egg, larva, pupa, or adult. So if there are any bugs in the, uh, the stored, um, in the food that you bring in, if you put them in the freezer for um, a couple of days, maybe a week to be safe, it will kill those life stages and hopefully stop the eggs from developing into the, the larvae. Um, you can store them in the refrigerator. Some of these can be stored in the refrigerator for a longer amount of time to slow down the development of the insect. It may not kill the insect, it might, um, but you can store them in so that any infested food items that are nearby in the pantry cannot get to this new food that you brought in. Uh, you do want to store foods. Let's say you put them in the freezer or maybe you didn't put them in the freezer and you just put them into the pantry you can store them in airtight containers like the ones you see here, um, mason jars or you know, other kinds of tightly sealed containers. Uh, store them in these so that if there is an infestation in the item you brought in, it won't get out to your other foods. Um, and so it's stayed in your container. But if there are other um, foods or some pests that are finding their way into your house, they won't have access to the food if you have stored it in these um, airtight containers. Another uh, thing that you know we're we're taught to clean up our messes and spills, right? But any kind of crumbs on shelves or on the floor around the pet food on the counter, any of those um, those food items can also be attractive to any pantry pest that we may have in the house and some of the other pests that I'll talk about that may uh, come in or, or thrive um, with this available food. So we wanna clean up any, any spilled foods or crumbs inside the pantries, uh, in the cabinets, on the counters, drawers, um, anywhere that the food is going to be stored. And you wanna keep the storage areas dry. Uh, so I mentioned moisture is, is something that is, um, conducive to the development of, of these pests. So you wanna keep the areas dry. And then also you don't wanna to have too much moisture around some of these stored grains because they might mold. Um, and when you bring in new food stuff, let's say you have some spaghetti and you're just about out and you brought in some new things, don't mix them because you might be introducing uh, new pests into an area where you didn't have any. So use up the old one before you mix in with the new. And then cleaning containers in between. There may be that you have some eggs or you know, some of the hairs of the larvae and you didn't see them. So you, you wanna clean the container before you add 
new um, food material to it. So these are all ways you can prevent problems. If you already have uh, an infested food item or an infestation, um, there are lots of things that you can do. Uh, it might not happen overnight that you can control an infestation. It depends on the level of infestation and also what you're dealing with. Um, but you need to try to prevent reinfestation or movement from one kind of food stuff to another. Um, and some of these pests can survive for, for weeks. Um, even if you've, you've put all the food in the freezer, let's say, or um, you, know, you, you threw it out, um, some of these pests can still survive for weeks in, on the shelves, in the cabinets, on other food items. And one thing that we, we do say is just if, if you have some of these, these um, pests in the pantry or in the kitchen, you don't have to throw everything away. Um, you can freeze them to kill the life stages and you can uh, sift out any of the beetles if it's a flower or a grain where you can separate the food from the beetle, that might sound gross to some people, but you know we recognize that you know food's expensive, especially nowadays, and you can't always afford to throw everything away. But certainly, if it's one of these pests that may have those hairs, and the hairs are um, irritating you, you might consider throwing it away or giving it away to somebody who's not sensitive to it. Um, but if it's really heavily infested, you you should probably throw it away, especially like I showed with the, the cow pea um, weevil. Uh, you know, there's no nutritional value when the, um, the level of infestation is so high. Um, and then, of course, storing everything in tightly sealed containers as best you can. Um, and for finding out if you don't see where the uh, the moths might be going, you can get these pheromone traps, which is something that's shown here. And there's different manufacturers of traps. Uh, you don't have to uh, use the brand that, that we're showing here. Um, the pheromone traps have an attractive uh, chemical called a pheromone, it's not a pesticide, but it attracts the males of the Indian meal moth species or any specific pantry pests that are listed on the trap, it attracts the males thinking they're going to find a mate using the pheromone. And that lets you know where these pests are. It's not going to be a trap for, for um, controlling an infestation, but it's a way to help you know that you have them, maybe how many you have and where exactly they are. And then you can target your control measures in that area. Um, we don't recommend using insecticides for pantry pest control. Um, you certainly don't want to spray areas where your, your food is kept, um, but cleaning up, uh, having good sanitation of the shelves and the cupboards and anywhere that the food might be, um, uh, the bird seeds, the tobacco products, et cetera, et cetera, any of that is going to reduce the available food for the pantry pests. Um, and so again, tightly sealed containers, throwing things out. You can also vacuum up any crumbs, uh, vacuuming in the cupboards. And it might be something that you do on a semi-regular basis, right? You're not gonna do this all the time, but to, to clean out the cupboard every so often, rotate the food, go through, see if there's something that's really old, you might consider throwing it away or giving it away. Um, and then vacuuming the, the, the corners. Uh, even though you might not see any beetles or moths, you know, sitting around, they may be in the corners where, where there's um, crumbs. And then wiping things down with soap and water. Soap and water is, is really all you need to clean up the area. You don't need to use disinfectants necessarily and definitely not spraying pesticides. Um, and, uh, and freezing things, as I mentioned before. So this is just kind of a, a summary of the same thing. I do want to talk about some other pests now. There are ants that will get into our kitchen and into our foods, as well as some of the other pests like rodents and um, other uh, smaller, um, uh, less significant, less common pests, as well as flies. So ants can be indoors and they can come, uh, they can come indoors from being outside. Most ants are going to 
be outdoor nesters, but they can certainly find their way in if there is a food source for them. And then the other invaders, like I was talking about, and this is an ant, not a sawtooth grain beetle. Sorry about that. Carpet beetles is another one that you may find in your kitchen, um, but uh, carpet beetles tend to eat like feathers and wool. So they might be in other parts of the house, not necessarily in the pantry or the kitchen. So I'm not going to talk about carpet beetles today, but some of the beetles do resemble a few of the other beetles that we talked about and the larvae do too. So just keep in mind that there are other similar looking insects that could be in the house, but they're not necessarily um, kitchen or pantry pests. And not all ants are going to come indoors and feed on um, indoor foods either. Uh, so uh, another um, less common pests that can be in our pantries are sosids. Uh, that's how this is uh, pronounced, sosid. These are really, really small. They almost are the size, they're, they're bigger than fleas, but they, um, they're small wingless insects. They can be found um, in various things in our kitchens and our houses. Sometimes sosids are also called book lice and bark lice because they feed on and are found within books and where papers are kept. And I bring this up because, you know, some of our houses are small, some of them are big. There's, there's not a whole lot of difference between the kitchen area and other storage areas, but you might also have um, recipe books or paper with saved recipes in your kitchen that after some time could be attacked and infested by some of these, these sosids. And um, what they are doing in the kitchen, they feed on molds and fungi, but also on grains. They might feed on some of the insect fragments that have uh, body parts that have uh, become separated from their, the, uh, the insect and other kinds of starchy material. Uh, so packaging that we bring food into has um, paper material. There, there is glue that holds a lot of the packages together. So people can sometimes find these sosids in the package that the food is brought in on. And so not to, um, uh, not to think that every box of cereal or box of something um, is a tightly sealed containers. They, they may also have um, other pest issues. And sosids prefer warm and humid places. So again, that the humidity and the moisture control may be important depending on the level of humidity in your house. Um, and they're really, really small. Um, so they could be found uh, where there is excess moisture. So if you do have moisture in an area, you um, may have that water source that is attractive to other pests and some of the ones that I'm going to talk about in a moment. So the ants, and I kind of said ants and then I skipped uh, to a few other things. Um, ants are indoors or outdoors. Um, they, they do have their place outside. Um, but they can be pest outdoors and, and then when they find their way inside, uh, they may find um, a, a very comfortable uh, place with shelter and good humidity and uh, some of the foods. So before, um, before knowing exactly what to do about ants, we need to identify which ones we have. Sometimes ants just wander in and they're not going for the food in our kitchen. Um, and they prefer to be outdoors. Sometimes they do come in and they find uh, suitable conditions and also a source of food and shelter. So we want to find out where the ants are coming in and uh, exclude them by using caulking or other blocking materials and then find what food they are going to and seeing if we can clean up a spill, uh, remove the crumbs, remove the food source, um, ants can certainly infest some of our packaged foods. Um, they get into pet food. Uh, so um, ants aren't necessarily treated as pantry pests, but they can get into our kitchens and they can get into our pantries and stored food areas. 
So you want to try to exclude them um, as best as possible, but sometimes you need to follow that trail back to see where they're coming in. They may not be coming into the house or into the kitchen in an air in a place that's obvious to you at first. Uh, so once you do find where they're coming in, properly sealing them. Sometimes it's caulking material that works best. Sometimes it's a different kind of sealant. Depends on the size of the opening and also the the material um, that makes up that that wall or opening. And wiping up ants in their trails is one good way. You don't need to spray um, with with any kind of pesticide because that that spray residue, you know, we're talking about the kitchen, you're going to um, not want to have pesticides around your food preparation areas and your food storage areas. So just getting soap and water and wiping the ant trail, um, it does disturb their ability to follow that trail with the, the soap. Um, but just like any time you've tried to manage ants, you don't just wipe up the trail and that's it. No more needs to be done. You need to continually um, sometimes wipe them up, but also removing the food source. Where are they getting into? Um, sometimes it's just water that they're attracted to. So figuring that out may take a little bit of time. And then if you find that um, they're continuing to come in, you may use um, little bait stations that you place near the entrance and they will hopefully find the the poison bait as something attractive and then they take that bait back to the nest which is typically outside sometimes it's in uh, other places in the structure and then they feed that poison bait to the colony um, but foggers and sprays are really not useful for for ants in the home uh, switching over to cockroaches and I'm just touching on all of these, these pests. We have other webinars and lots of resources that I'll tell you about that gets into more specifics on these pests. But cockroaches can be a pantry issue, a stored food issue, and a kitchen preparation um, issue. So there's lots of different kinds of cockroaches. Some of them are outdoor dwellers and some are indoor dwellers. So here you can see German cockroach and the Oriental cockroach. So the indoor species are the German cockroach and the brown banded cockroach. And this is just for California. There's lots of cockroaches all over the world. But in California, we have these two species that um, prefer to be indoors and are more of a pest issue in kitchens. And then the outdoor dwellers in that right hand list, um, those prefer to be outdoors, but they might wander in. And so um, the reason we are concerned about cockroaches in the kitchen is that they do develop very quickly and uh, the female lays her, her um, eggs within an egg case. These are all egg cases. And then the egg cases will open up. They hatch out into all the little uh, juvenile cockroaches and they can get quite numerous quite quickly. But cockroaches, um, they they can carry diseases and we um, and they can also induce asthma or lead to asthma. So we do want to make sure that we are uh, keeping cockroaches out of the, the kitchen and identify what species you have first. Maybe it just wandered in. Maybe it's one of the indoor dwellers. And then once again, keep your food in tightly sealed containers. Um, you know, clean up any spills or messes or attractive areas and manage the moisture and any um, leaky pipes, which can be attractive to the, the cockroaches, the ants, the beetles, um, the sosids. And there are things that you can do to keep any of the outdoor dwellers from getting inside. And so what the gentleman in the picture is doing is installing a, a physical barrier um, called a door sweep. And there are door sweeps that are made from little bristles. Um, there are some that are like metal plates and you can install those on your outward facing doors to limit, to block um, crawling pests um, or um, even rats and mice from getting in. And I'll talk about rats and mice in a moment. Um, but again, pesticides in the house are uh, not great for exposure of our own selves and health to pesticides. So sprays are not recommended, but there are gel baits 
that can be put out if the cockroaches need to be managed with pesticides. Quickly, there are various types of flies that can be indoors um, that can get into um, our kitchens mostly, less so in our stored grains. Um, but the um, adults um, are shown for, for a few different indoor types of flies. Um, they develop by uh, egg, larva, pupa, and adult, as I mentioned with the beetles. And they can feed on um, decaying material, rotten fruit, um, uh, compost um, bins that you have indoors sometimes, and um, they can spread diseases and, and other pathogens. So this is just quickly to mention that there are some indoor flies that are more problematic than others. And certainly there are outdoor flies too. Um, but the one that we are concerned with indoors often are the house flies because they can transmit diseases by landing on our food and our um, food preparation area. And, um, you know, they visit rotting food. And so it's garbage or sewage, and they can pick up some of these diseases and transfer them to the food in the food preparation area through their, their regurgitation and through their feces. Um, and so you can see there the list of pathogens that they can potentially um, spread, but they also annoy us. We don't like flies buzzing around when we are indoors or outdoors, um, but certainly they can be um, a, a health issue. Also an annoying fly indoors are fruit flies. And fruit flies, this picture shows it really, really big, but fruit flies are really tiny. And fruit flies uh, can be around the kitchen and can also be annoying, but they are there because you have some sort of attractive food, usually a ripe or even rotting or fermenting fruits and vegetables. Um, so they do like bananas and, but also potatoes, onions, anything that is going to be um, ripening and, um, and uh, uh, attractive. So you want to find out why the fruit flies are there and dispose of or store that attractive fruit, um, fruit or food, either in the fridge or, um, you know, throw it away if it's overripe and that should get rid of the fruit flies um, for the time being. Um, and just be mindful of, of uh, the next time you have overripe or rotten uh, fruit and vegetables around. Uh, lastly, I'll talk about uh, rodents. Um, there are a few different rodents that can get into our pantries and our food storage areas, and they are a health concern as well, and sometimes difficult to get rid of because they can reproduce quickly, um, but they carry infectious diseases. Um, they can lead to um, asthma and asthma attacks, um, but they also can bite humans, and they may also attract other pests like flies. Um, through their, their feces. And frankly, we just don't want them in our food, do we? So, um, you know, they can be quite repulsive too. So rodents do gnaw on things to create holes and pathways. They can, they can chew with their very sharp teeth into wood and plastic and get through areas that we may not think that they can. Um, and they do reproduce quickly and they travel in certain paths. And so knowing a little bit about them can help us um, know where we might find them and, and also exclude them or trap them. So mostly when we're talking about rodents indoors, we're talking about um, rats and mice. And so they, they have feces that can um, contaminate our food, either stored food or food um, preparation areas. And um, and so the, the feces can uh, carry diseases and we, we definitely don't want to have the rats themselves um, or mice scurrying over our, our foods or defecating on them. So identification is important. Um, rats are mostly outdoors and they're a bit paranoid and they don't really eat uh, that much food, but they still can, can eat our food and drink water um, and they can get into our buildings or into cupboards through a gap that is uh, only a half an inch, so the size of a coin. 
And then mice um, are mostly indoors, whereas rats are outdoors, but come indoors. Um, mice are also very cautious. They eat very little food a day, um, every day. They rarely drink any water. So water isn't as important um, of a control measure for rats and mice. Um, and they can get into um, uh, an opening the size of a dime, whereas rats the size of a quarter. So really small entry uh, areas is, is how they can easily get into our kitchens and from room to room. And uh, they don't travel quite as far from their nests as rats do. Um, and so they stay a little close to home. Rats tend to burrow outdoors and um, they can um, be around trash, but they can also get into our our homes, uh, bringing in diseases from, you know, trash and, and rotting areas and, and feed on food and then go back out to their burrows. Whereas mice, they might nest indoors where we have clutter or um, where we might have stored items. They can also nest in walls, um, but beneath refrigerators and stoves or even inside stoves that aren't used very frequently. And, and other storage areas within the house. And then they may come out at night and feed on any crumbs that we've left for them and, um, and get into our pantries and cause issues. So we want to try and eliminate any of the harborage. So for rats, especially outdoors, so that they don't find a comfortable place to stay outdoors and then get indoors. And then obviously cleaning up and having good sanitation indoors is going to be important so that we don't continue to have this attractive food source um, for, for the rats and mice. And then um, in addition to cleaning things up, but if you do already have an infestation, there's lots of different traps available for rats and mice. Placement is very important. And today we're talking in general about pantry pests and kitchen pests. So we do have information um, and other webinars on specifically uh, controlling rodents, specifically controlling ants. And uh, we do have the UCIPM website, which has information for free on all the pests that I've talked about today, as well as other pests. So you stick to the home garden, turf and landscape pests, and you find our, our library of information here. If you go to the pest notes library, or you can navigate any of these other areas, you'll find some of our pest notes series, which focus on some of these pests. So this one in particular is on pantry pests. So it goes through all of the information that I just talked about uh, for the pantry pests and how to prevent them, how to exclude them, and how to manage an infestation and identify. So we have all of this information on our website. We have a key to identifying um, ants as well, and we have information on the rodents, the ants, the um, flies, uh, and all kinds of, of great information for you to look at. Okay, we have um, a little bit of time for questions, if there are any questions. Thank you, Carrie, for uh, that great talk, and thank you everyone for joining us today.